So Matthew chapter 5, of course, we're in uh, part 2 of Matthew 5 as we're working through the book of Matthew chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And if you were here last week, I'd recall we preached to, uh, through verses 1 right up to 17. So we'll jump right into it through there in verse 18 where Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 18, uh, or excuse me, 17, verse 17, Think not I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy or to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now that uh, fulfilling, that word fulfilled there is something that comes up a lot in Matthew. You, if you, if you, as you go through the book of Matthew, as we're going through it in your own Bible reading, you'll, you'll hear that phrase a lot, you know, that, that it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled, and he fulfilled, that the saying of the prophet might be fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled a lot of things uh, in his life, and a lot of those things we see in the book of Matthew. Uh, Christ has fulfilled all that was spoken of him. As he says there, you know, that there shall no one jot or tittle pass away till all be fulfilled. Now what it's speaking of is the things concerning himself. I believe that is what it's referring to there, the things that he would fulfill. And if we could just, you know, just very briefly, I'll just kind of remind us of a lot of the things that Jesus Christ fulfilled just out of the book of Matthew alone. The Bible says that uh, he fulfilled, you know, his, his, uh, his virgin birth was prophesied in chapter 1. His return from Egypt, if you recall, they went down in Egypt to flee from Herod and came back in. That was fulfilled in chapter 2. His dwelling in Nazareth, after they came back in, into, uh, in, in, uh, from Egypt, they dwelt in Nazareth, so that he might be called a Nazarene. The beginning of his, met, his uh, ministry in Capernaum was, was prophesied by the prophets. His healings were prophesied by the prophets. And we see those uh, fulfilled in verse 8, or chapter 8. His ministry to the Gentiles was something that was prophesied. And that was fulfilled in verse 12, or chapter 12. His parables, the things that he would open his mouth in dark sayings, that was prophesied and fulfilled in, in, in chapter 13. His meek entering to Jerusalem, if you recall, when he came meek and lowly riding upon an ass and, the, and a colt of, or a full of the colt, colt of an ass. That was prophesied. And he also fulfilled that in, Matt, in uh, Matthew 21. His disciples forsaking him in the garden, that, that, that was prophesied and fulfilled in Matthew 26. Even the casting of the lots for his garments after they crucified him and the Roman soldiers cast uh, lots to see who would get his clothes. That was uh, prophesied and fulfilled in Matthew 27. And that's just the book of Matthew. And really, that's pro I'm probably leaving out a lot of things. I mean, that's probably a lot. We could probably do a deeper study and, and look at a lot of those things more closely. But it's pretty amazing just to think about the fact that there was a man on the face of the earth named Jesus Christ that lived and fulfilled just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that was prophesied about him, you know, over the course of thousands of years. I mean, if that's not evidence of a holy and divine book, if that's not evidence of this book being written by the finger of God, I, I don't know what is. Amen. The fact that a man can come and do the things that Jesus did in one lifetime just fulfill all of these prophecies. Amen. So that's a pretty amazing thing to think about. Now notice it says there in verse 18, he says that, uh, I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill... For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise and pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Meaning this, that when these things were fulfilled, there were going to be some jots and some tittles that fell from the law. Right? We talked about that Sunday when we were talking about how we no longer worship on the Sabbath day, how that's been done away in Christ, how the Old Testament, you know, certain parts of it concerning the priesthood and the carnal ordinances, those things have faded away. Those things have gone away because... These things have been fulfilled. So it only makes sense that some of those things have passed away. And again, as I, as I said on Sunday, that's not to think that all of the Old Testament is no longer relevant to the Christian today. You know, a great deal of it is. You know, there's a difference between, uh, you know, the, 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 the carnal ordinances and then like the civil law that God lays down. The civil law is still something that we can use. Obviously, as Christians, we have to obey the higher authority that's given to us. But that is still something that God considers relevant. It's not something that God has done away with. <clears throat> I'll remind us of what it says in Acts uh, 3, verse 18. It says, But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all of his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. I mean, Christ has fulfilled all these things. And that's why, as a result, some of these things have passed away from the law, because Jesus has done what he said, that he has fulfilled all these things. For example, in Hebrews 7, it says, For the priesthood being changed. So there was a change in the priesthood. No, we're no, they, they, Jesus Christ did away with the Levitical priesthood and he installed a new priesthood you know, after the order of Melchizedek. And uh, <clears throat> that's why it says there, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So there are some things that have passed away. And again, that's 
not really the thrust or what I want to focus in on tonight. There's some other things in this chapter that I want to get to. So we're just going to keep moving along here. And it says there in uh, verse 20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying here that if for a person to want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. And at first glance, you know, that might, I remember when I first got saved and I first started reading the Bible, this first kind of intimidated me and confused me a little bit. Probably because I had this preconceived idea that that the Pharisees were somehow these holy and righteous people, whereas that the more you read and study your Bible, you find out that's not the case with them. They were actually very wicked and evil people. So that might sound intimidating at first to say, hey, your righteousness has to exceed that, uh, exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. But what you have to understand about the Pharisees is that they didn't set the bar very high. You know, what Jesus is saying here is like, don't use these guys you know, as a measure. If you're going to use the, the scribes and Pharisees, as a measure of, he of how to get to heaven, well, it's got to be better than them if you're trying to work your way into heaven. I'll just remind us of Luke 18. This is the kind of a thing that, that went on with the Pharisee. If you recall the, the, when Jesus talks about the two men that went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, <clears throat> I, I extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So that's this guy kind of patting himself on the back, really thinks he's something, right? And it's just funny when you read this, the, the arrogance of this individual to say, you know, thank God I'm not an extortioner. Thank God I'm not an adulterer. It's like, well, good for you, buddy. You know, you've really, you've really uh, outdone yourself there by not being an extortioner or, you know, uh, an adulterer or a Republican. <clears throat> you know, this, this is, we kind of run into this sometimes out soul winning, though, don't we? You ask people, well, what do you got to do to go to heaven? And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, live a good life. You know, that's a common answer. And a lot of people have this idea that if they don't do really bad things, that some other are going to get into heaven. And that's really what that is, is them just kind of relying on their own righteousness. It was, it's, it's kind of like they just think they're going to go to heaven because they've lived a good life. You know, they, they say, well, you know what, I've, heard, I've had people at the door say, well, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't robbed anybody. I've never raped anybody. I'm not as bad as this guy over here. You know, that's not what gets us into heaven. That's not, God's not looking for us to be the bare minimum, like, Oh, so you're not a murderer. You know, you're not the worst possible human being there is, so therefore you should get into heaven. That's, that's not the goal. That's not what we're shooting for. That's not the bar. That's not what we strive for is to just not be a murderer. You know, by all means, please, do not be a murderer. <laughs> you know, uh, but we got to think a little bit higher than that. So when we read this verse where Jesus is saying you have, your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, we shouldn't let that intimidate us because, again, the Pharisees weren't, you know, all that they were, you know, thought themselves to be. But if we look at verses 21 through 30, we're going to read through these. What really Jesus is doing us here is showing us that we are condemned, that we are, uh, these verses here, they kind of condemn us by showing us our righteousness, by showing us that it does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. And that shows us that we do not meet up to the standards that God has. Amen. So if we look at verse 21 there, for example, the Bible says there in verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. <clears throat> but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So he would say, you know, I, I haven't killed anybody. At least I haven't killed anybody. Well, God kind of raises the standard a little bit, doesn't he? He says, it's, I'm, that's great you haven't killed anybody, but if you don't, you shouldn't even be angry with somebody in your heart. Now, of course, we need to take note of the words there. It says, without a cause, right? Because there's this mentality out there, this philosophy, this thinking that, you know, you should never be angry with anybody over anything. That we're always just supposed to be nice and, and, and loving and kind and never get upset and never, never get angry about anything. But it says, without a cause. Meaning, you know, there is a time to be angry. You know, if your brother has offended me, you know, in, in, in something, you know, that, 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 should, that is, it's right for you to be upset about. There are times that we can be angry. But Jesus here is showing us that how, you know, we have to ask ourselves, how often have we been angry with somebody without a cause? Probably, if we were being honest, more often, you know, we've, been, we've done that. You know, some people probably more than others. But I mean, just for example, think about, you know, driving in traffic, the road rage, right? I don't know what it is that comes over people when they get behind the wheel. 
it's just, you know, I, it's something I've struggled with in the past. Like, I, you know traffic is going to be bad. You know people are going to be stupid on the road. You know they're going to do things. But somehow I end up finding myself being angry without a cause. You know, hating my brother without a cause. Hating my neighbor without a cause. He didn't use his blinker. You know, he merged. He's, you know, I, I'm already doing 20 over. Oops, you know. You know <laughs> why is he tailgating me? <laughs> so, you know, but I'm trying to make the point here is that we do come up short, don't we? You know, it's not enough to just say I haven't murdered anybody. You know, God's great, you know, grateful for that, but here's the thing. You should, God's going beyond just the letter of the law saying, hey, you should also not be angry at your brother without a cause. You know, verses 27 and 28, uh, you know, kind of uh, drive this home too. It says there in verse 27, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed her with adultery with her already in his heart. You know, and if, if as men, you know, just... Any any just man with a pulse has probably been guilty of this. You know, this is something that we as men have to work on, especially in the culture we're living in today, where you know where women are just being flaunted on every billboard and magazine and commercial. I mean, it's just we're just surrounded by it. You know, the way women are walking around dressed today, just you know, trying to catch a man's eye and trying to get a man to think about these things. And and so to sit there and say, well, I've never committed adultery. Well, that's good that you've never done that. But again, Jesus is trying to use these verses, I believe, to show us that the real problem is the heart. The problem is on the inside. The problem is, you know, that we have a sin nature. You know, because we've done all these things. You know, we, 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 we've lusted. You know, we've been angry. You know, there's all these other things that here in these verses that, uh, that he talks about. You know, getting right with your brother, uh, agreeing with your adversary, you know, not lusting with your eyes. So these are all things that we're not supposed to be doing, but in all likelihood, we've probably been guilty of. You know, so this thing of being like, well, I'm not a murderer and I'm not an extortioner, that's not going to hold up. Your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Amen. <clears throat> now look at verses 29 and 30. The Bible says in verse 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. <clears throat> so what Jesus is saying here, you know, it, it would be better for you to pull out your eye and cut off your hand than to go into hell. Right? He's saying, you know, if, if these things are problems for you, you know, and, 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 and he's saying it would be better for you to pull out your own eye and cut off your own hand in order to, for you not to do these things, in order to, so that your righteousness might actually, uh, you know, be greater than that of the Pharisees. Now turn over to Mark chapter 9. Keep something in Matthew 5. And of course we know that, you know, cutting off our hand and pulling out our eye isn't going to get us into heaven. That's not the point that Jesus is trying to make here. You know, don't go home and do that. All right? You don't need to do that. In order, we know that the only way our righteousness is only going to, you know, uh, surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees is if that our righteousness is that of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's Amen. the only righteousness Amen. that's going to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That's whose righteousness we need, not our own righteousness. But these verses are showing us that our righteousness does not exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. We don't want to be like a Pharisee and say, well, at least I'm not as this guy. You know, now we don't want to be as all those other people, all the lost people that we meet out door knocking when we go soul winning every week that just want to say, well, that think... I'm not as bad as other people. You know, I've lived a pretty good life. That's not good enough to go to heaven. Yeah, because right. Jesus is showing here that there's things in our heart that those are the things that condemn us. I'll get over to Mark chapter 9 with you there real quick here. What Jesus is trying to show us here is not, you know, that that salvation is through disfiguring yourself. That's not what he's trying to, to, to imply, right? He's not saying, you know, you guys need to do this. What he's showing us here... Is, is trying to kind of bring home the reality of hell and how terrible it is. That it would be better for you if, the, if, this is, if this could keep you out of hell, if this were the only thing that could keep you out of hell, it'd be worth doing. And if, I tell you what, if Jesus Christ said, if the Bible said, hey, if you, if you want to stay out of hell, the only way to stay out is to pull out your eye and cut off your hand, you should be willing to do that. I mean, if we really understood the severity of hell, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we probably would willingly do that. If we could take a glimpse at hell or go to hell for just a moment to understand what it's like, and they were put back here, and Jesus, and Jesus said, hey, now, if you don't want to go back, pull out that eye and cut off the hand. I bet most of us would do it without hesitation. Right, yeah. Hell is that bad. That's what Jesus Christ is trying to show us here. In Matthew chapter 9, he kind of drives his point home even further. In uh, verse 43, he said, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. So it's better thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, 
Even the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter and halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell where into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. For it is better for thee to enter the kingdom of God having one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the hell fire where the worm dieth not and where the fire is not quenched. Jesus is saying it would be better for you to do all of these things than for you to go to hell. He's trying to warn these people about the severity of hell. And one of the, we would think, man, the, he just notice every verse there he's saying, you know, cut off your hand, cut off your foot, pluck out your eye. And between every one of those verses he's saying, where the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not. Where the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not. This warning. And we would think about the fire, right? We would think about how terrible that would be to just be in hell and be there forever. You know, the Bible says that people that go at the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. That once you go to hell, you're stuck. There is no purgatory. It's not temporary. And the Bible says that it's forever. And it's a terrible place. And we would think about the fire and how terrible that is. We would think about the worms. I mean, a lot of times I think we only think about the fire, but he did say there are worms that die at night. I mean, that, I don't exactly know what that means, but it's nothing pleasant. It's nothing good. But consider this, that the company in hell is bad enough. As it says, in Re I'll read for you from Revelation 14. Revelation 14 says this, And the third angel followed him and said with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive the mark in his forehead and or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with malt mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with the fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. I mean, you'll be, it's not just bad enough that you'll be there forever, forever. It's not just bad enough that people are going to be there in fire with a worm dying at night, but you'll be there with some of the worst people that have ever walked here. It's going to be people that were willing to worship the beast. They hated God so much that were not willing to repent of their sins after all of the things that they saw God do, that they still refused to repent, and they were willing to go ahead and take the mark. I mean, wicked, evil reprobates are going to hell. And so, I mean, the company alone is bad enough. I mean, would you like to get just thrown in a room with a bunch of just, just the most disgusting, perverted, vile people there are? I, wouldn't, I don't want to spend more than, I don't want to have to even look at them more than two seconds. You know, we run into these guys out door knocking, and it's just, they just scream, homo. You know, it's just like, I can't wait for them to reject the gospel. Yeah. I get right to it. Hey, can I show you what the Bible says about going to heaven? No, thanks. Amen. Bye. Amen. I'm out of there. Have a good day. Or don't. You know, I don't say that. <laughs> but I, I think in my heart, I don't care what kind of day you have. I sure wouldn't want to spend all of eternity rubbing elbows with those people. Yeah. That's how bad hell is. Hell is terrible to, to the point where God is saying, cut off your hands and your feet and your eyes, if that's what it would take. Of course, we understand that's not what it takes. You know, our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees because of the righteousness in Jesus Christ. So thank God that we don't have to experience the torments of hell and that we don't have to go to such lengths as, you know, cutting off our own body parts to not go there. Thank God it says, if you would turn over to Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, I'll read to you from Romans 3 as you go to Romans 8. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may become guilty before God. That's what Jesus is trying to do in this passage, I believe. Where he's saying, hey, if you've even hated your brother in your heart, if you've even looked down upon a woman with lust, he's trying to stop every mouth and help people to understand that they are guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. When we start to read Matthew 5 and we see how we measure up to these things, we have to say, you know, my, my, my righteousness might not, be, might not be where it needs to be in order to go to heaven. I'm probably not exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees here. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for Amen. there is no difference. Thank God that he's just made the way that we, all we have to do is believe, that we don't have to know these torments of hell <clears throat> Look at Romans 8, verse 3. For the, what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That's what He did when He came here. That's what He's doing in Matthew 5. He's condemning sin in the flesh. He's showing us we don't measure up. That the righteousness of law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And that's kind of, and of course, we, when we read Matthew 5, 
you know, we can understand that there's a lot of practical application that we can make along the way as well. But I think the overarching theme of what Jesus is doing here is trying to show us that we don't measure up, Amen. that we need His righteousness, that we need to trust in Him. <clears throat> but of course, He's take, probably taking the opportunity too to kind of remind us, hey, this is how you should behave with one another. <clears throat> as He says there, you know, if, if your brother have ought against thee, leave therefore for that gift before the altar and, and, and go make it right. <clears throat> and then come and offer that gift. Let's go ahead and move along. Let's look at verses uh, 31. Look at verse 31 here. Because <clears throat> he deals with this, and you know, I know I've preached on divorce, but this is just one of those dogs you have to kick every time you walk by it. Because divorce is just so prevalent in our society. I mean, people can be married one day and think everything's going right, great, and if they get into church where it's not preached on or, or, or you know... Look, the Bible doesn't say a lot about how to have a good marriage. I mean, it does speak to it, but there's not a whole lot that's in there. But he does talk about divorce. And I think sometimes, in order for us to have a good marriage, in order to make it work, we just have to re be reminded that divorce is not an option. Amen. I say that divorce is not an option. Amen. Amen. You know, that's how we should go into marriage, understanding with one another that divorce... I mean, it is Valentine's Day, right? So we can, you know, that someone asked me to preach a Valentine's sermon and say, yeah... Here it is. Divorce is not an option. Right? Right. Happy right. Valentine's Day. So you better make it work. You know, you better go buy the box of chocolates and the roses and, and, and kiss and make up if you need to. Because <clears throat> divorce is not an option. And that's that's kind of what he deals with here in verses 31 and 32. The Bible says there in verse 31, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, Saving for the cause of fornication, cause of her to commit adultery, and whosoever is married to her that is divorced, committed adultery. Now go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Now, what's interesting here is it sounds like Jesus is giving us an okay in some instances to get divorced. Is that what, I mean, that's what he's saying here. He says, except it be for the cause of fornication. You know, let, you know if that's the cause, and we have to understand something, that fornication is what takes place out of marriage. Once you're married, you know, that no, it's no longer fornication. If, uh, if people get married, and then one of those people in that marriage go out and, you know, have relations, physical relations with another person outside of that marriage, that is not fornication. That is what the Bible calls adultery. Okay? That's important to understand because there'll be people that will be married, Christians even, and they will say, well, so, you know, my spouse went, you know, and, and, was, and cheated on me. Okay? And then they'll say... So that's, that's fornication, therefore it's okay for me to leave them. That's not what the Bible is teaching here. Because fornication is something that takes place outside of marriage. Right? That's, once, once we're married, and that, if that were to happen, that becomes what the Bible calls adultery. There's a difference between adultery and fornication. <clears throat> so it, it sounds like here he's, he's kind of giving them a pass. right? Like he's saying, but, you know, if there's fornication, it's okay. Well, it's not that it's okay. It's just that God... He, he, it's not so much that he's giving, making an exception. I, I heard him put it this way uh, recently. I thought this is a really good way to put it. It's not that God's giving you an exception in, here to get a divorce. What he's doing is he's making a concession. God knows because it says there in Mark chapter 10. Let's just read Mark chapter 10. Look at verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him, Mark 10, 2, and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. You know, they're tempting him in this question. They kind of already knew the answer, right? These guys are always up to that. Verse 3, And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. So it wasn't because God was un, you know, being understanding and saying, Yeah, I know it's okay in this instance. He says right here, the reason why he made this clause, if you were to go back, you know, I don't know if we have the time to really go look, look at it here in Deuteronomy 24, but in Deuteronomy 24, I'll read for you, it says, when a man hath taken a wife, this is what Jesus is referring to here. When he says, for this cause, you know, uh, uh, Moses gave you this precept. Okay, this is the precept, is, is Deuteronomy 24. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he had found some uncleanness in her. You know, it's not just because she, he had found no favor in her, she had found no favor in his eyes because she burned the muffins, you know, or whatever it might be. You know, I don't, I, you know, there's this one exception here. 
<clears throat> because she hath, he hath found some uncleanness in her. Then him light him writing a, a, a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And she is departed out of, out of his house. She may go and be another man's wife. Now when he says that he finds some uncleanness in her, it doesn't mean that, you know, she never washes her hair. It just means that, you know, that she's she was not found a maid. She was not found virgin. You know, he thought she was a virgin, and then he find, goes to marry her, and on their wedding night, he finds out not the case. You know, there's been some, uh, she's been deceptive. You know, she hasn't been forthcoming with that information. And then God says that in that instance, and that's the only instance that you'll find in Scripture, that God says, go ahead and write a bill of divorcement, put it in her hand, and she can go marry another, and you can go marry another. And it won't be adultery. But in anything outside of that, it's, God says it's adultery. Right. <clears throat> So how often do you think that happens? Do you think that makes up the vast majority of divorces in America or even in the world today? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. A lot of it's because of what? Money. You know, money problems is one of the main leading problems. Or children, you know, we're child rearing. They have differences there. Religion or all these different things, you know. That it's never this, you know. Because most people, quite frankly, not, both of them would be found unclean on their wedding day. I mean, it's not the vast majority of people are getting married. It seems like these days a lot of people are getting married that are they're, neither of them are virgin on their wedding day because of the culture we're living in. So that's not really a concern that people are, uh, have these days. But it's interesting the way that Jesus said that even in that instance, even in the instance where where uh, you know th there's been some uncleanness there, that you and you're and God is permitting you. He's saying. He's giving you that concession to put her away. Jesus still says it's because of the hardness of your hearts. <clears throat> you see, when we marry somebody, why are we marrying somebody? Are we marrying somebody just because, you know, we just... We should marry people because we love them. That's why you would marry somebody. At least I would hope, right? Amen. You know, you would marry that person because you love that person. Because you care about that person. You want to take care of them. You want them to take care of you. You want to spend your life together. You, you've gotten to know them. You know, you've talked about things. You get along. You enjoy their company. Most of the time, hopefully, right? You know? No, no, they, nobody's perfect, right? We all, no marriage is perfect. People have to work things out, of course. But he, he's saying here, I, I believe the reason why it's hard, he says that's a hardness of heart to put away a wife in that instance, in an instance of uncleanness, is because we ought to be willing to forgive. Even in something as dire as that. And I would say that even to people who, who were, were adulteries taking place. That, you know, the Bible doesn't say that that's, a, that's cause for divorce. And that puts you in a tough situation if, that's, if that happens in your marriage. And really, the only option in the world we live in today is forgiveness. And, you know, it's easy for me to get up and say that, because praise God, I've never had to deal with it. And I pray the Lord never do. You know, be, I can't think of, I, I honestly, I don't know that, that, I could probably only count a few other things, maybe, on my hand, one or two things I could think of that would be worse than my, my spouse committing adultery on me, or vice versa. I mean, it's a terrible sin, but the world mocks it today. They call it all these nice affairs. You know, they call it affairs. They call it, you know, uh, they, 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 put, make, they put up websites where you can go out and find one. You can go out and commit adultery. They don't call it adultery anymore. They call it an affair. They call it all these other things, right? <clears throat> but I, could, I, I can't think of something worse. I can't think of a more, you know, uh, just hurtful thing that another uh, a person could do to their spouse. Amen. Amen. I mean, it's terrible, right? So for, it's easy for me to just get up and say, well, you know, you shouldn't have a hard heart and just forgive them. I don't say that lately. But the, I believe that is, I mean, when we read this story, that's kind of what Jesus is saying. At least in this cause of, of, of fornication. We're saying, you know what? It, it'd be better that you just didn't have a hard heart and went ahead and kept her as your wife. Bible says in Proverbs 10, he that stirreth up he hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. We are getting a Valentine's sermon today, aren't we? <laughs> love covereth all sins, right? <laughs> he that covereth a transgression seeketh love. And hopefully my wife's listening. I can say, yeah, it was my Valentine's sermon. I didn't forget. I, I wrote my sermon for Valentine's Day, right? I didn't forget, by the way. <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs, the discretion of a man deferred his anger, and it is the glo his glory to pass over a transgression. You know, it's a glory for a man to pass over a transgression. And I tell you what, if you really loved somebody and if you really cared about that person, you would pass over the transgression. You would learn to forgive. You would learn to move on and move past that. Of course, they have to be genuinely sorry. There has to be some real repentance in order to forgive somebody. <clears throat> and we should never think that, you know, just because our spouse maybe has more of a checkered past than us or has done things that we haven't done, that we can't still have a great godly life with them and raise wonderful godly children. 
in spite of all that. You know, we talked about in the beginning in Matthew chapter 1 about, you know, the lineage, the genealogy of Jesus Christ and some of the people that are involved there. And I would remind us again in Matthew 1, 5 where it says, And Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab. Rahab was the harlot in Jericho, right? Not exactly a woman of, of, of the best reputation, with the best past. Somebody who definitely, when, that, when, when Solomon married her, she had some uncleanness in her. You know, she wasn't pure, she wasn't virgin. But he was able to look past that and, and love, probably love this woman. And, and of course, he went on to have Boaz, which was one of the great, one of the great men of the Bible, the man who, who married Ruth, the man who showed great compassion, compassion towards, towards another, you know, a stranger to Israel and married her. So, <clears throat> you know, it's important that, you know, we have a, a, we're willing to forgive and, and not to think that, you know, because people today, they're just looking for an excuse, it seems like, sometimes to get a divorce. You know, some people are just on that knife's edge, just like wait for the other one to mess up, you know, and, and try to get that divorce, you know. And if we start to make concessions, you know, if pastors and preachers get up and start to say, well, you know, in some instances it is permissible. You know, it could be that people don't, there will actually be couples that might be at just, just wanting to get a divorce so bad that they'll try to push the other one to that extreme. Right. Or, or they'll start doing things to try and get them to say, well, see, I did this thing and, and you know, that's one of them, and, and now you should divorce me. You see what I'm saying? Like, if we start to let people, start to give people reasons why divorce is okay in some instances, some people will jump on that and they'll take it. They'll say, oh, well, so adultery, if, if, if he commits adultery or she commits adultery, I can get a divorce? Hmm, you know? They said the wheels start turning. And then they'll go out and commit adultery. So, you know, adultery, you know, it, it, there is no, there is no, uh, 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 reason for a person to get divorced. Amen. None. The Bible doesn't give it. I mean, the one we read in Deuteronomy, that takes place like, you know, the honeymoon. Day one. You know, you can't find that out and then years later go, well, you know, I remember now on our honeymoon that I found some uncleanness in her. No, I'm going to divorce her. It doesn't work like that. It's like that day. That's the only clause you find in Scripture. And even in that instance, it was because they had a hardened heart. Let's go ahead and move along there. I think, I think we kicked that dog. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and we'll look at verse uh, 33. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, <clears throat> but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. <clears throat> but, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither uh, by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. That's too bad for some of us, right? We would love to be able to do that, right? I'm getting a few myself, like, man, it would be great to... <laughs> this is true, Lord. Right? But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now it says there in verse 34... To swear not at all. Now, <clears throat> this isn't the same as swearing. It wouldn't be like the same as like if you were going to make a pact with somebody. You know, if you were going to vow a vow to another person like in marriage, right? That's not what it's saying. It's not saying you shouldn't make like foolish oaths to God. You shouldn't swear and and uh, you know and, and, and say things that you you're not entirely sure you can keep. That's because there's a lot of times there's certain things that are out of our control that we cannot that would cause us to break our vow. Now, marriage isn't one of them, is it? We can, we can keep our vows in marriage. But foolish vows before God, I believe this is what he's referring to, like things that, that could go on, that could be broken, you know, even out of, outside of our, our own uh, ability to control it, things that we didn't intend or foresee. You know, certain unforeseen things could happen that, that could cause us to break the vow. And if you would, turn over to, uh, to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. Now, remind us of one of these vows. And just remind, this is important why it's not to just make a vow to God, you know, foolishly. And in fact, Jesus says, swear not at all. Don't even do it. Just say yes, yes, no, no. Are you going to do something? Oh, I swear, I promise. Just, yeah. Just be a man of your word. Just if you're going to do something, just, just do it. Amen. You know, your actions speak louder than words. Amen. I mean, you can talk to somebody all day and ask them if they're going to do something and say, hey, are you going to do this? And they can tell you yes, 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 yes. And it still doesn't get done. You know? But if they just go and do it, you know, there's no question about it. You're going to Judges 11 or minus, you know, one, a couple of examples where people swore foolishly. 
or made a vow without consulting God. You know, Joshua made peace with the Gibeonites. Remember, they're coming into the land, and the Gibeonites who were near unto them heard about it, so they made themselves into strangers. They, they put on their old clothes and their moldy bread, and they told them they were strangers from a distant land, and that they had heard about you know them and how great how great they were and how God was with them. And they said, make a pact with us so that what they were trying to do is just you know save their skin because they knew that they were going to get wiped out. So they come up with this elaborate lie, and Joshua doesn't consult God, and he falls for it. And he makes this pact with them. He makes a vow that they wouldn't hurt them. And then they find out three days later that, in fact, that they're, they're Canaanites. They're the people that they were supposed to have wiped out. But now, they, and, but now they can't because it was more important that they kept the vow that they kept to God. Joshua said, we can't go back on our word. He said, we have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. So Joshua was somebody who was understood that, that you, know, you don't break your vows to God. When you make a vow, you keep it. But the lesson is to not make the vow, right? He, he, he should have just consulted God and found, he probably would have found out very quickly what these people were up to. But you're there in Judges 11. Remember the what, vow, what Jephthah did, verse 30. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt fail, without fail, deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whosoever cometh forth out of the doors of my house, whatsoever cometh out of the doors, forth out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. I mean, this guy is just going over the top. This is just like one of those hyper-spiritual, super, or just, you know, zealous guys that just, you know, whatever comes out of my door when I get home, I'm going to sacrifice unto God. He didn't really think that one through, did he? I mean, he's probably hoping that stupid dog that was keeping up was the first thing that came out, right? So, or the cat or one of the kid's pets was going to be the first thing that came out to greet him. Right? He didn't think it through. Notice he says, or what, whatsoever. He didn't stop to consider the fact that it might be whosoever comes out, right? And of course, if you know the story, he goes home, the first thing that comes out of the door is to greet him is his daughter, his young daughter. And he says, I cannot go back. And I'm not going to make excuse for what happened in that story. God didn't say it was the right thing to do. God just tells us what happened. That man sacrificed his daughter to keep that vow. You know? I mean, a lot of application we could make there. But here's the, here's the point. Let's not make vows to God. You know, let's just not swear at all. Just let your communication be yay, yay, and nay, nay. If you're not going to do something, just say you're not going to do it. Amen. And if you are going to do something, then do it. Amen. And just say you're going to do it and do it. <clears throat> now, the other thing I want to look at in verse, if you go back to Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 5, I kind of want to focus in here on these last few verses. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2. Beginning in verse 1. It says, uh, Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him plain. Give to him. So notice, first of all, this is a guy who's already walking with you, right? You know, right? This is a guy that's already going in a certain direction. He just wants some company. Go a mile with me, brother. Go with him twain, right? This isn't a guy who's saying, Hey, would you mind pick me up and carrying me on your back for the next two miles or the next mile, right? He's a guy who's walking with you, right? Maybe he wants companionship. Maybe he's worried about being safe along the way. Okay, keep this in mind because this is kind of all leads into, into the next, into verse uh, 42. And it says, give to him that asketh thee. Right? That's not a period there, though. It's a comma. Okay? And it says, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. The key to this passage is him that would borrow of thee. Right? Because... A lot of people will look at verse 42 and say, we should give to every him, him that asketh thee. Meaning, every bum on the side of the road, every bum that's out in front of whatever store I'm trying to go in, yeah. and sees me coming, and we, I think I talked about this from the pulpit the other day, they, they, I don't know what is it about this space, you know, I should scowl more, you know, <laughs> maybe it's because I was going into Best Buy down here and I had my suit on, you know, for church. Yeah. You know, maybe I should go in rags more so these guys wouldn't ask me, but they see me coming and just something about me, they go, hey, man, you got a dollar? And then the next guy will come in behind you. They won't ask him. I'm like, man, do I just look like a sucker or what? <laughs> you know, I just, I don't know. Maybe I just look too nice. I, that's probably not the case, right? Can I get an amen? Don't amen that. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, we shouldn't give to every bum. You know, every guy that just asks of us. That's not what the Bible's saying here. Every guy, you know, with bloodshot eyes and filthy clothes, who's, you know, laying in his own filth 
and just looking to go get his next crack rock or going to get next, his next bottle, who's just too lazy to work, who doesn't want to do anything, who doesn't want to earn an honest living, just wants to bum around, not have any rules, not have to get up and work hard like the rest of us. That's not what the Bible's saying that we should give to that guy. That's right. The Bible says the complete opposite about that guy. What it's saying is here we should be willing to give to him that would borrow of thee. Now, when it, the Bible says borrow, it means something that you're going to give back, right? Something that says, hey, I need, I need to, I need to ask, can you, can you lend me this? Can you, you know, like the guy that says, can you go a mile with me? You know, can you go with me a mile? You know, not saying, hey, can you stay with me for the rest of my life? You know, he's going to let you return, go back, you know, eventually. He's going to borrow your companionship for a little while. It's him that would borrow of thee. Not, not just every guy that wants your money for, and, and no intention of returning it. You know, I don't believe in that. I don't believe we're just giving money to bums. You know, and it's, it's amazing. I'll even, I, we were out soul winning last week. We knocked on a guy's door, and uh, I believe it was Brother Andrew, and this guy was like, I'm not dependent upon God. I don't need religion, something like that. And he said, but hey, I got a, I got a friend. He's kind of short on rent this month. Does your church uh, help out with that? I'm like, I'm like no. And we walked, and I was polite. I just kind of said, well, you know, we're a small church right now. Just try to make it sound like, I didn't want to, like, rebuke the guy because he's already kind of cantankerous and, and rude and everything like that. And he wanted to just, you know, give him a bad, another reason to hate Christians or something. But I, uh, I walked away, and I just said, and I'm like, man, is it, I think they see church, and they just read the letters ATM. You know, because, but can you blame them? Because there's so many churches out there. That's what they are. They're just a social gospel. They're not preaching the real gospel. Yeah. They're not doing the real works of God, going out and trying to get people saved and into heaven. They just want to feel good about themselves. So what are they doing? You know, the soup kitchen. You know, they're handing out the blankets and putting people up and stuff like that. <clears throat> right. The Bible teaches elsewhere concerning people who are too lazy to get a real job and work. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 10, or 2 Th yeah, 2 2 Thessalonians says, for, whenever, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. I know there's no 10th chapter in 2 Thessalonians, but it's saying here that, that if somebody doesn't work, that person shouldn't eat. If that person isn't working, that person shouldn't be eating. Right? Now that's not what we see in our, in our society today at all. People cannot work their entire lives and just collect a check that we went out and worked for. We'll go out and they'll take our tax money and give it to some guy who's too lazy to work so that he can eat. That's not biblical. That's completely wrong. And if you would just stop feeding people, and if you would just stop taking care of their everything, if there wasn't just, you know, if the government wasn't just their nursemaid at every turn, and helping them, you know, make all these ends meet. You watch how quick some of these guys get a job. Yeah. You know, these people quit handing out money to the people on the off ramps. You watch how quickly they disappear. You know why guys stand out on the road with a sign, with with signs that'll just, you know, just flat out say I'm lazy practically, because it works. That's why they do it. Yeah. Because and I get more angry at the person I see roll down the window and give them money than I do that guy. Mm. Because they're enabling them. That guy needs to go hungry. That guy needs to learn what it's... Because you watch, they'll clean themselves up. They'll, all of a sudden, that, that drive through job, you know, with that, that window, that Taco Bell doesn't sound so bad. Yeah. They'll be putting that headset on and, and brushing their teeth. And if you want fries with that, you watch how quickly those words come out of their mouth thing. Right. But that's not the world we're living in, where people are just giving out money. Because they don't understand this. They don't understand the Bible, what it means. The Bible says, if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, yet denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And the guy that's not willing to go out and work for a living and provide for his own, the Bible says he's denied the faith. He's denied the faith and it says he's worse than an infidel. Somebody, in, He's worse than an enemy of, of the faith. <clears throat> but it does say, him that would borrow of thee. So there are instances when we should give things to people, right? Or, or we should lend to them. We should be willing to help out our brother. We should be able to go that extra mile for somebody. You know, I, and here's, here's the thing I want to, this is something that I learned years ago. From, this is something I heard preached, and then this is something I learned the hard way. You know, this is something I learned why I should put it into practice. Is don't lend things you aren't willing to lose. Don't ever lend something, don't ever let somebody borrow something if you're not ready to just kiss you goodbye. Right? And as a result of that, I no longer lend out tools. <laughs> you know, if you're working on your car and you need a socket set, Home Depot on every corner, buddy. You can take 30, 40 bucks and go down there and get your own socket set. I got tired of borrowing everybody else's wrenches and socket sets and, and how one organized and thought, man, I could organize these so much better if they're mine. I went out and bought my own. In fact, when we moved out here from, Fe from uh, Michigan to Phoenix, 
You know, I had everything I had when we moved out here I had to fit in the back of a Camry, along with my wife who was six months pregnant and my two-year-old. We had to fit everything in a Camry. That's all we brought out here. And I'll tell you what, I fit those tools in. I got that chest of tools that I bought for 300 bucks or whatever from, from Sears. I stuffed that thing in there. I just bought them a few months ago. I said, I want these things because I didn't want to borrow. And when, as soon as I, people started to find out, oh, Corbin's got tools. <laughs> hey, man, i got to change a starter. i got to change a, this or that on my car. Can I, yeah, borrow my tools. And then I'm out there working. Where is that deep well, uh, you know, quarter inch, 10 millimeter socket when I need it? <laughs> you know, it's always the one that you need is the one they lost. Or, you know, it got rolled under somewhere in their hood, and, it, and you know it's just rattling around somewhere in their car and underneath their hood. <laughs> and you need it. You're there, and it was so frustrating. That happened to me a couple times where I finally just, I remember one time, I was, you know, I feel bad because I felt like I was a little rude to the guy, but he called, and he's like, hey, man, can I borrow your tools? And I was just, and he's like, hey, you got some tools, right? I'm like, yep. Yep. <laughs> he's like, well, uh, you think I could borrow them? It's like, uh... I'm not at home right now, <laughs> if you leave a message, so it's, but I was kind of like, gave the cold shoulder over it, you know, and, you know, and uh, anyway, the point is, we should never loan something to somebody if we're not, you know, willing to see it just go, go away, so think about that, I mean, we should be generous people, you know, maybe this is more for me than you tonight, we should be willing to lend to people, let them borrow of us, but that doesn't mean that we just give to every bum and derelict on the corner. Amen. Right. Now, I know we've been here a little longer, uh, but I do want to get through this chapter. And I do want to look here at verses 43 and 44, and we'll wrap this thing up here. Look, it says there in verse 43, I've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What I want us to notice here is that there's a difference between our enemies and and God's enemies. Okay? There's a difference between somebody being your enemy and somebody being the enemy of God. Because people will say this. A lot of times you'll see people that, uh, when some preachers get in hot water, you know, because he said something against, you know, the homos, where he's gone out and said, hey, you know, they're a bunch of filthy, vile reprobates and they're all going to burn in hell. Amen. I mean, if you said something like that, you know, then they would get in trouble. Then you'll have all these so-called Christians hop on their social media and things like that. Well, Jesus said you should love your enemies. But here's the thing. That guy, you know, the homo, the reprobate, is an enemy of God. Amen. Buddy. He's somebody, Amen. the reason he is that way is because God's given him up to a reprobate mind. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see that here. And I do want to focus on that because this is important, especially the day and age that we're living in. There is a difference between our enemies and God's enemies. Turn over to Psalm chapter 139. Psalm 139. I want us to just get, because people want to say, well, we should never hate anybody. That's not what the Bible teaches. Amen. The Bible says you should, you should love your enemies. It doesn't say you should love God's enemies. And you better mark it down and believe me. There are people that God counts as his enemies in this world. Yeah. There are people that hate God, hate the Bible, hate Christianity, and they consider themselves an enemy of God. They consider God their enemy. And if someone's going to consider them themselves to be God's enemy, I'm going to mark them my enemy. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says in Psalm 139, let's look at verse 19. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved, up, grieved with them, with those that rise up against thee? Verse 22. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. He didn't say, I hate the guy that bumped into me in the parking lot. I count him mine enemy. I, you know, he... He said, I hate the guy that hates you, Lord. He says, I hate him with a perfect hatred. Amen. So there's nothing wrong with hating people that hate God. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we want to get, you want to mark me a, a hate preacher, go ahead. Amen. You know, you want to put this church in your, in your, on your list? That's the big threat right now, right? We're going to put you on our list. <laughs> you know, well, make sure you send us a plaque while you're at it. And I'll, I'll put it back there. I'll put it right on that wall. And we can all look at it and say, praise God, we hate, we hate people that hate the Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and there's a whole bunch that we could look at. And I, I really don't want to, probably should have got to it sooner. But I'll, I'll just kind of go through this. I think most people in the room kind of understand this doctrine. You know, we should hate people that hate God. And that's why I hate the reprobate. That's why I hate the child molester. That's why I hate the pedophile. And I'll tell you what, if there's anybody that has a bleeding heart for some pedophile, for some child yeah. molesters, for some, you know, total reprobate, you know, I don't want anything to do with that person. Amen. You know, there's the door. 
If you don't like it, you can go and never come back. Because I hate people that hate God and, and, and would you know, do such terrible things to other people. I love Amen. kids enough to hate these filthy homos. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible says, if you're called King Jehoshaphat, he went and linked up with uh, Ahab, right? The wicked king of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that, that uh, when he did that, that God was displeased with him. And the prophet came to him and said, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? He's saying, why are, you, why are you having affinity with Ahab, this wicked king who hates me? He says, Therefore is wrath upon thee from the Lord. Look, you know why I hate the homo, why I hate the child molester, why I hate the pedophile, why I hate the reprobate? It's because I don't want wrath upon me from the Lord. Amen. And all these churches are going to let these people come in and just invite everybody's welcome and just have all the homos in and sit them down and let them work in their children's ministries. You mark it down, there's going to be wrath upon those people Amen. from Amen. the Lord. God hates some people. Absolutely does. The Bible says this. I'll read for you Psalm 115. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Amen. God hates the one that loves violence. And when it's talking about violence, it's not talking about MMA. It's not talking about two guys that are, you know, consenting to a, to a, 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 a boxing match, you know, a physical fight. People have this wrong understanding of violence. Violence is when you're harming somebody, when you're violating them, right? That's the God who hates those people. Surprise that God hates people that would violate, you know, innocent people. Amen. And in return, you know, God hates some people, and we people will just gasp and think, oh, that's so terrible. Well, what about the fact that there's some people that hate God? We never thought to think about that. I think it's worse that there's people out there that hate God. Yeah. People like, get all upset that when you think about the idea that maybe God hates somebody. Like, that's just the worst thing possible. How could you say that about God? Well, the Bible says it. Amen. But if, you, you know, that, if that's your logic, I think, don't you think it would be worse that there's people that hate God? Bible says in Romans 1, 28, and as, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't want to keep God in all their thoughts. They would rather not admit that God, they want God to just go away. They don't want to even acknowledge His existence. They don't want to know anything about the Bible. They don't want to know anything about church. They hate God. They don't want to retain Him in their knowledge. The Bible goes on and says, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Reprobate meaning rejected. God rejected them. And right. gave them over to do those things which are not convenient. And all these filthy, vile, disgusting acts that these, these haters of the Lord get involved in are not convenient. Meaning it doesn't come naturally to you. You wonder why some people could do some of those things that they do? It's because they've been given over to the mind of a beast, the Bible That's says. Right. God has given them the heart of a beast. <clears throat> he says that he will repay him that, that hate him to their face, to destroy them. Now here, I want to close by saying this, because it's really easy to get fired up about hating you know, the reprobates and the homos and the haters of God. But let me just say this, we got to temper that, because not every lost sinner is a hater of God. Right. Not every, you know, and, and if we're going to be honest, we were all, at one time or another, God's enemy, to some degree. The Bible says in you, in Colossians, it says in you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So we were at enmity with God at one time. That doesn't mean we were haters of God, you know, but I don't want people to get the wrong idea that every lost person is just this evil, wicked reprobate. The vast majority of people aren't. They're just, they're just lost. But there are people out there that do hate God. And mark it down, I hate them. The Bible says in Romans, and God hates them too, by the way. Romans 5 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled by God to his death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we were enemies. In the sense that we were unsaved, in the sense that there was, you know, we had the flesh between us, and that we had a sin between us. And I'll say this too: that even the same Christian today can be counted God's enemy. You say what? James four says, "Ye adulterers and adulteresses, knowing not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God." So even a saved Christian who wants to take the side of the homo, who wants to go and side with, you know, apologize to the LGBTQ HIV crowd. <laughs> and say, oh, we apologize for God and apologize for the Bible, they're siding with the world. They're, that's friendship with the world. And they are at enmity with God. Amen. And wrath will be upon them. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, 
If we love our neighbors, then of course we know that we're going to that we're going to keep the commandments of God. He said, "Love your enemies." Isn't that what started all this? When he said, "Love your enemies," so we should love our enemies, and we should pray for those that despitefully use us. You know, some jerk on the job site wants to talk bad about us. You know, somebody is just doing us dirty at work or wherever. And it's just made themselves our enemy. We should love that person. We should suffer them. We should because you know God suffered us. And we should be long suffering and merciful to that person. Amen. Not but not everybody that hates God. You know, that the haters of God do not fall into that category. It's there's a big difference between my enemy and God's enemy. You know, and he and he says there in uh, basically what Jesus is saying here at the end of Matthew is that we should love the unlovable, not just your friends. It's really easy to come in here and shake hands and smile and we all believe the same thing, and we all love God, and we all love the Bible, and we all love soul winning, and we all get along. You know, it's real easy to salute our brethren, right? But even the Pharisees knew how to do that. Even though they, they, you know, they got along with, you know, birds of a feather flock together, you know, and, they, and they're pretty happy that way. But it's another thing to go out and love the people that don't love you. It's another thing to go out and knock the door of some stranger who maybe is a little cantankerous or having a bad day and try to love that person and give them the gospel. If you want to love the unlovable, you should be going soul winning. That's like the most loving thing a person can do. Amen. Is to take your time and your energy and take this book, the Bible, and go out and try to give a person an opportunity to hear a clear presentation from the Word of God. You know, People that might otherwise, that guy that cut you off in traffic, maybe you'll knock on his door one day and say, hello enemy, let me love on you. Let me give you the gospel, right? Yeah. <clears throat> In verse 48, it says, Be ye therefore, the last verse, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You know, we do all these things. We love our enemies, you know, and we do all these things that this chapter's talk about. Um, not in order to be perfect, not in order to be complete, but because we are perfect. Because in Christ we are complete. Because Amen. in Christ we do have his righteousness. That we, in Christ our righteousness does exceed that of the Pharisees. Amen. Through faith we have that. And that's why we should do all these things. Not in order to earn heaven, but because we are the children of God. Because we are on our way to heaven. That's why we should try to do all these things. And that would include to love our enemies. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.